You know, the midlife crises, they're usually, people usually apply the term to married men. Yes. Does it affect single men? It affects everybody. Uh, married men because the fallout of a married man's life crisis is pretty highly publicized. Um, there's divorce, children suffer. Um, it becomes the, you know, it becomes the subject of mass entertainment, any number of movies. But the notion that other people don't undergo a midlife crisis just falls. Think of the 1960s and all the women who decided I can't be a housewife anymore. I, I can't do this anymore. I, I got to get out of, and I, I got to work. I got to work. Um, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with going to work, but frequently the women who said that were in their late 30s, early 40s. They did it not because they had to work, not because they saw they were fulfilling a need, but because they didn't feel they were getting what they needed from the lives they'd been living. Now, admittedly, the lives they'd chosen were pretty impoverished, did need to change, but that's because they had grown up in emotionally impoverished homes who taught them to live as a housewife in a way that was incredibly impoverished. And, you know, if you don't deal with that issue, getting a job is not necessarily going to make you the kind of person who goes into something because they're needed there. It affects women too? Sure. Of course it does. Of course it affects women too. I'm not satisfied being um, a housewife because, in fact, I find this life just doesn't meet my needs. I find it's like a prison. And it used to be talked about that way. Often it was, because the two people who built the household were not well enough to make it anything but a prison. So, yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon for women to show a radical departure from the kinds of, and rejection of the kinds of routines they'd lived in before. Or you just have expressions of extreme unhappiness. You know, the, the woman may not leave the home, but she becomes much more vocal about the fact that she is not happy there. With women, there is something of a difference because there is an enor has been an enormous pressure on them to stay with the children. And this is an external pressure. And there are real cons, there have historically been real consequences of a, um, an uncomfortable, painful nature for women who reject that role. Like they don't get to see their children anymore. You know, to say I don't want the kind of relationship I had or, you know, to live as a housewife is not to say that I don't want to see my children anymore. Well, unfortunately, that's going to be the upshot at, at many periods in, in the history of all sorts of societies. So women tend to be forced to stay in environments that they would rather leave. What if some people are happier by themselves? Well, there are a lot of people who are happier by themselves. The question is, um, do they have to gift themselves to feel that they are not living empty lives or lives that are not fulfilled? A lot of people who live by themselves don't. They live by themselves because they recognize themselves as filling a need in an ecosystem which doesn't involve human beings. I'll give you an example. This isn't the kind of ecosystem we usually think of. We usually think of nature, forests, rivers, things like that. But I'm talking about a different type of ecosystem. Ecosystem is a life system. Um, the scholar spends a lot of time in uh, libraries alone, 
reading. What's he doing there? Well, what he's doing is he's developing research and, and extending knowledge. Why? Why am I there? Because there's a need for this and I'm where I'm needed. I'm needed in a lonely place. You can think of a lot of examples. A lighthouse keeper, they don't exist anymore because all lighthouses are automated, but lighthouse keepers exist in a lonely place. They're not gifting themselves. They're there because they're needed there. You might be needed in a place where you end up being alone. So yeah, I think you would find that Midlife crises extend across the population, um, especially in middle class and upper middle class. Why not working class? Reason's quite simple. Working class people, up until really the first world, no, the end of the second world war, lived something very close to what we would call slavery. It wasn't always called that, but that's the kind of lives they were living. Their, their ability to make choices and move out of where they were was extremely limited. And secondly, the kinds of lives they lived were incredibly hard. Most working class people up until the end of the Second World War were old at 40. Why were, and what did that mean? It meant they could no longer do the jobs they had been doing for the last 30 years, yes, they started when they were 10, because their bodies were broken. That's the kind of work they were doing. So by the time working class people reached what we would call the era of the midlife crisis, they weren't middle-aged, they were old. And then you see them dying at 50, so they don't really have the energy left even for a midlife crisis did they want to be happy it's harder to say it, nobody really th talked about the middle classes being happy they talked about the middle classes being content what's the difference content is you'll put up with it you'll put up with it happiness wasn't an option fulfillment not an option. Toil was the only option. So if I, you know, if you said, you know, what is your goal to a working class person, say in the 19th century, it wouldn't be to be happy. That's not on the table. It would be to be respectable. Because that means that you wouldn't be treated like dirt. And that's kind of the best that they could hope for. So are midlife crises a modern phenomenon then? Wherever there are wealthy people, it doesn't matter where we're talking about in, in, you know, in history, there's going to be a midlife crisis. We can think of the example of the Buddha. Um, the Buddha Siddhartha, when does he live? He lives probably 5th, 4th century BCE, 2400 years ago. But what do we know about him? This was not a poor man. This this was someone who had the status of a prince. He lived a very wealthy life, and he lived the life of someone who was being constantly gifted. Constantly. He was showered with gifts. That was, that was his normal day. And eventually, because he has slightly better mental health than the people around him, it disgusts him. He says, there's something wrong with all of us, and he includes himself. How, how, how can we possibly find this satisfying? It's just disgusting. So what does he do? He goes on a whole, I think about 15-year journey of spiritual improvement. What's he trying to do? He's trying to make himself better. So, you know, give people the opportunity, the energy to um, experience the full consequences of their poor mental health. They'll have a midlife crisis. 
Are people being selfish because they tried being selfless before and it didn't work out? In a sense, yeah. It works like this. I have poor mental health, but I'm young. And I have a lot of energy and I'm very idealistic because I'm innocent, because I'm young. And people tell me that I can make a difference in the world because I'm great. So I'm going to go and make a difference in the world. And that means I'm not just going to live for myself. I'm going to do great things for humanity. I'm going to save the world. And eventually I get tired because my energy runs down. And I don't like it anymore. And I don't blame myself and say, well, you know, there's something wrong with me. Say, well, it sucks to, you know, be selfless. So I blame being selfless. And I say, I will be more fulfilled. I will be happy because I'm going to be selfish. And that's a mistake. Being selfless amongst the very young is usually simply a type of gifting. The gift is you will be included in this loving family that gives. And you'll be one of the givers. And you'll get the love that you never got as a child. And that is just a falsehood. It's the same story. The story of needing to be gifted because you have nothing to give.